Hi, and welcome to Janine's presentation on what is autism. I'm not a professor or otherwise qualified expert, but I hope you'll find this useful. First of all, we must admit how little we actually know about autism, and lots of research and discussion is ongoing. So what is autism? The National Autistic Society describes it as a lifelong developmental disability affecting how a person communicates with and relates to other people. It also affects how they make sense of the world around them. I think that's probably accurate, but I think it's also a little negative. So here's an alternative. Autistic spectrum conditions are neurodevelopmental conditions. They occur when atypical brain connections lead to atypical development. Autistic brains make connections in unusual ways. That graphic is by Landon Bryce. And if you have a look at his website, thoughtcast.com, you'll find lots of other useful graphics and information. For those of you who haven't heard it before, I'd like to introduce the concept of neurodiversity. This means that humanity, the human species, is neurologically diverse. Different people have different brain wiring. Autism is an example of this neurological diversity or neurodiversity. Autistic people are neurologically atypical or neurodivergent. Other neurological conditions include dyslexia, dyspraxia, dyscalculia, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder. And people without one of these conditions, without a minority neurological condition, are referred to as neuro neurologically typical or neurotypical or even NT. Autism is a spectrum. Oh, look, there's a spectrum. This means that autism affects different people in different ways. You may well have heard terms such as Asperger syndrome, high functioning autism, classic autism, low functioning autism, PDD NOS, that's pervasive development disorder, not otherwise specified. But I rather like this quote from Aspies for Freedom. The autistic spectrum covers a very wide range of people and these people don't always fit neatly into the available groupings. Essentially, the people in all the above groups are all a part of the autistic spectrum. So what's the official definition? Well, that stack of books there is the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's the diagnostic Bible of the of the psychiatric profession. And here is how it defines autism. You have to tick all five of these boxes to pass the test and qualify as autistic. A persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction, B, restricted repetitive patterns of behaviour, interests or activities, C, the symptoms must be present in the early developmental period, i.e. when you're a little kid, they must cause clinically significant impairment, that's D, and E, they must be not better explained by intellectual disability. So there you go, that's very medicalised and it's very negative couched in terms such as deficit and impairment. In the 1970s, Dr. Lorna Wing came up with another way of explaining autism um, called the triad of impairments, where she observed that all autistic people, however different we are, share difficulties in three areas of life, social communication, social imagination and social interaction. I think that was a useful step forward at the time, but I think it's probably been superseded by uh, more modern approaches such as neurodiversity. From here on in this talk, you'll see a strip across the bottom of each slide. It says autism is a spectrum. Individuals may have these traits in different ways to different degrees or not at all. And the rest of the slides now are an attempt to explain what I've just told you in more plain English. So social communication. People on the autistic spectrum may communicate differently from typically developing people. And that will be on a range from verbal to non-verbal means of communication. Some autistic people don't talk at all, but that doesn't mean that they don't communicate. Social interaction. Typically developing people learn social conventions, such as how conversations go, through social interaction from childhood, from the people around them. Autistic people may not do so and may only learn these social rules by being taught by themselves or others. Now, this reminds me of how we learn language. So you learn your first language through social interaction with people around you, primarily through the people who you live with. You then might go on to learn another language. If, you, if you're brought up in a monolingual household, this may be your second language and you might learn it at school. You learn it through studying and through being taught. 
For autistic people, it may be difficult to read emotions in people's facial expressions. There, apparently there are only four basic emotions, happy, sad, angry and afraid. And neurotypical people tend to rely on facial expression as well as simply words to communicate how they're feeling. Whereas autistic people may not and may have to learn how to work out how other people feel from their facial expressions. Similarly, it can be difficult to read social cues such as when to speak, when to stop speaking, when a conversation is over, how close to stand to someone. Although, in fact, those are all rules and conventions set up by society. So what we're actually having to try to read is when people expect us to speak, when people expect us to stop speaking, when people expect us to know that a conversation is over, how close people expect us to stand to someone. Social interaction. Many environments, whether that's the workplace or circles of friends, have unwritten social rules. But if they're unwritten, how are we supposed to know what they are? How is an autistic person supposed to know what they're supposed to say or do? Autistic people tend to like structure and predictability. Rules. I like rules to be clear and people to stick to them. Routines. I like to do certain things in certain ways and do not like this to be obstructed. Schedules. I like to know what I'll be doing when and for that to happen as prompt. Eye contact may be uncomfortable or difficult for autistic people. When you have a conversation, the organs you're using are your mouth and your ears, so it can seem illogical and distracting to insist that you lock eyes as well. And this T-shirt says, I can actually listen better if I don't make eye contact. It's an autism thing. Please be understanding. Autistic people tend to think literally, but typically developing people often do quite strange things. They say things they don't mean, like, I'm going to kill him when they have no intention of killing him at all. They tell you to do things they don't want you to do, like pull your socks up. They ask questions, but they don't want an answer. You might work in a call centre and the person next to you comes off the phone and says, why do I always get the rude callers? And you might answer saying, well, statistically, on average, you'll probably get the same amount as everyone else. And they'll look at you as though you're weird. They ask questions, but they don't want an honest answer. How are you? Apparently is basically a neurotypical form of greeting. It's not actually a question and you're not actually supposed to answer with a detailed description of your various ailments or your current mood. They answer a question with an answer to a different question. Are you having your meal break now? Answer, I've got to complete this report. Well, that's not an answer to that question. That's an answer to the question, what have you got to do next? They use figures of speech. They tell you you have ants in your pants when there are no ants anywhere near your pants. They don't say things that they do mean. So you can be rabbiting on about your uh, special interest of which more later. But if they're not interested, they often won't tell you that they're not interested. They'll just stand there and then avoid you from then onwards. They say things in an illogical order. So for instance, you may work in a shop and your boss might say to you, the shop's shutting, make an announcement. But isn't that the wrong way around? Aren't you gonna make the announcement before the shop shuts? They laugh when there is no obvious joke. Rotten weather today, ha ha ha. Not quite sure what's funny about that. They think you've said things that you haven't. So suddenly they're saying to you, you're saying that I'm wrong when you haven't said that and you don't mean that. They say the opposite of what they mean. They call this sarcasm. So you're working in that shop and a particularly obnoxious person comes in, is very rude to your colleague and then leaves. And your colleague says, what a delightful customer. And you think, no, completely the opposite, surely. And on top of all that, they expect you to figure out that that's what they're doing. They expect you to know they're being sarcastic or using figures of speech or what have you. I hope no one who's neurotypical and watching this is offended by this slide. Um, it's, not meant to, it's not meant to upset people. It's just meant to show things um, from an autistic point of view. Special interests. Many autistic people have intense interest in a particular subject. Could be anything. Maybe it's railway timetables. Maybe it's astrological distances. The strange thing about our society is that special interests like this are considered weird and nerdy, whereas other special interests such as obsessions with boy bands are considered perfectly normal, um, so long as you're a teenage girl. The next concept I'd like to introduce is executive function. This is the set of abilities that enables people to translate motivation into action, decide to do something and then do it, to start doing something, to change what you're doing, to stop doing something 
or to manage time. Autistic people may have unusual or impaired executive function. Motor function refers to balance, movement, coordination. Autistic people may have unusual or impaired motor function. Sensory sensitivity. People on the autistic spectrum may have unusually high sensitivity, hypersensitivity, or unusually low sensitivity, called hyposensitivity, to bright lights or darkness, colour, sound, textures, whether that's clothing or furniture, heat or cold. Autistic people may also experience sensory overload because while all this is going on, all these sounds, colours, heat, cold, textures, light, patterns, feelings, etc. My brain lets all this in. It doesn't seem to have a filter. So I can take in and process loads of information and think about it constantly, but it can overwhelm me. So let's add all these experiences together. Communication barriers misunderstandings, sensory sensitivity, sensory overload, unexpected changes, rules being broken, discrimination, prejudice. It's little wonder that many autistic people experience distress, anxiety, and if it tips you over the edge, then meltdown. Many autistic people have a technique for reducing anxiety known as stimming, which is short for self-stimulating behaviour. It's habitual repetitive movements that provide comfort and or stimulation. That might be rocking, spinning, jumping, skipping, and it may be flapping your hands. And if the non-autistic people says, person says, it makes me uncomfortable when you flap your hands like that, it would be better if they could remember that for the autistic person, they feel uncomfortable when they don't. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you want to know more, more videos, more information, more about the training I provide, then please visit my website, www.janemove.com/autism.